Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Western Spirit. Today, we have a very, very special guest. Dr. Wilfred Riley is an associate professor at Kentucky State University of Political Science. And uh, I have to say that Dr. Riley has written a number of books that I've read um, over the years. And his latest book, and let's just say before that, the topics that he touches are very, um, I would say it's brave to touch these topics in today's world. And so I really appreciate what you do. And uh, your latest book is um, Lies My Liberal Teacher Told Me. Um, and, uh, and so, Wilfred, welcome to the show. Great, uh, great to be on the show. <laughs> uh, we, we've been trying to plan this for a long time. So, Wilfred, uh, let me yeah, start it's to be, just... Start to be uh, a bit delayed. Like, I mean, I've been stuck on planes. Like, it's, it's a ridiculous saga. We may talk about it during this. But yeah, I, I ended up, this is the weekend for those watching. I ended up driving to college, throwing on a jacket. Like, I'm glad to finally be doing this, this program. So, glad to be here. Yeah, so, uh, well, we here we had a Hezbollah attack this morning, an Israel attack. So, so if you hear any sirens in the background, I'll run off and then I'll come back. So we'll be fine. Um, let me just start off with the book that you, the last book that you wrote. Maybe you can give us, I admit I haven't read it here. It's been hectic. So maybe you can give us just a few of the lies that children in the, in the West, I assume you, you touched more on American kids, but. Just in the West, the general, give us maybe two, three lies that liberal teachers teach the kids today. Yeah. And I mean, I, I will say you're being extremely calm, obviously. I mean, your, your country is at, at war right now. There's the Gaza war and it looks like there, I mean, there are um, airstrikes, if not ground strikes going on in Lebanon right now. I assume they'll be retaliating. So um, that, you know, good luck. God bless and all that. <laughs> Thanks. But, so in terms of the, the book itself, lies my liberal teacher told me, the dinner party pitch is that it was inspired by the previous existence of this entire genre of books that do two things. One is, excuse the language, just sort of piss all over the West, say Western culture is the worst in history, we're killers, we're brutes, yeah. we're the only people that ever had slaves. The second is implied that this is some edgy secret that sort of cool girls and boys know, but that most people don't. So college textbooks will have these sort of sidebars that say things like, your parents probably don't know a lot about gender-neutral feminism, but, and then they'll, you'll turn the page and it'll be the Seneca Falls Declaration or something like that. And they're, they're not just one or two of these. Like, this is the mainstream in American and UK. I'm not familiar with the rest of Europe, but social science. So, I mean, Lies My Teacher Told Me is a multi-million copy selling book. Uh, it came out in 1995. Um, the author, Lowen, is, is a well-known writer. And, I mean, that, that followed on the heels of a number of others. Custer Died for Your Sins by Vine Deloria, which is sort of a native history of the USA. Um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which literally is presented as a native history of the USA. You know, the 1619 Project released yeah. their book, 1619, which is subtitled A New Origin Story for the USA, kind of a black history for the country. Um, there's Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. And so I thought this whole dynamic was kind of interesting, where for the past 50 years, you've had kind of our center left to left partisans in charge of education. I don't think that's debatable. About 80 percent of teachers are women. About 70 percent of teachers are Democrats. Um, you know, 90% of donations from the primary teachers' unions go to the left party here. So you've had them in charge. But the, the theme has been them saying that kind of the other fellows are in charge and them criticizing things that were taught decades ago. I mean, the, the lost cause mythology of the Civil War. And so, I mean, I came of age in Chicago in the 1990s when people were arguing about whether Michael Jordan was better than Larry Bird. And the answer is yes, by the way, race is said. But I mean, it, it just struck me as so far removed from anything I'd experienced that I wanted to do an analysis of what they were saying. Are the narratives that we're now getting in the integrated upper middle class, and this has been the mainstream in our country, in our cities, at least in the North, again, for a lifetime, are those stories any more accurate than what we used to hear? And uh, my conclusion after I looked at 10 of them, and I think I did a pretty good job of research looking through the major textbooks in high school and early on in college, an unfinished nation and so on. This is a fairly serious book. Um, but my conclusion was, no, many of the things we're telling people now, uh, slavery existed primarily in the West and was worse there. 
or Native Americans were peaceful lotus eaters that spent all day making love and fishing with, you know, hand-tied flies. Those things aren't accurate. So, I mean, I, I wrote the book, and when you talk about the rest of the West, when you talk about uh, Britain or even Israel, you know, is the participation of the West in other regions of the world, has that been bad? Uh, even, quote-unquote, settler colonialism, if you look at outcomes in an upper-middle-income state like Kenya, Jamaica, was that bad? Was that primarily a process of war, or did you have two peoples meeting and negotiating? And I find that the, the mainstream narrative, which is focused very much on this story of oppression and attempted revolution, doesn't capture most of reality. It leaves well, out these fascinating stories like the King's African Rifles that used to be the focus of education. You know, how did these powerful peoples get along with each other? You know, the um, Rudyard Kipling sort of stuff, East meets West. I mean, obviously, you take out the insults both groups use for each other if you're teaching kids. But that, that's all been forgotten in favor of this sort of one-lensed narrative of oppression. And in, in a sense, that's often wrong. It's often just complete BS and nonsense. Is the, just to clarify before maybe we get into specific lies, but is maybe the common thread of all these lies, like you said, coming out of a worldview that basically says anything that's white, Western, hetero, I'd say heterosexual, um, all these things together, and you've written other books in the past more specific about it, but is the common thread that those are all bad, and therefore anything that maybe puts them in a good light is something that we must denigrate, we must show that it wasn't good. You mentioned the 6019 Project. The whole point of the project, I think, was to say how bad America was, and there was historians that showed that a lot of it was junk, but the whole point that it was put up was to just show how everything that America's original point of origin was racist and, and you know, getting the slaves trade and all that kind of stuff and, and just omitting so many important details. So what is, am I right about that? Yeah, let me write one thing down. So first of all, yeah, the, the theme of the 1619 Project specifically is that virtually everything unique about the United States came out of slavery. And I believe that's a direct quote from Nicole Hannah-Jones, who was kind of the organizer and the boss lady over there. And yeah. that is an empirically false statement. I mean, when you look at many of the things that really distinguished the United States of America, like an Irish and Italian crew competing with a Chinese-American crew to build railroads across the country, another one of those great sort of boys' own book stories that we don't tell anymore, um, that did not... Uh, have much of anything to do with historical slavery in the southern region. You know, Indian immigration, the development by Asian and Jewish Americans of Silicon Valley. I mean, just even in terms of a lot of the things that I'm interested in as a black man, like the participation of the free black regiment, the Jins de Color, in the conquest of the South. Like, they were, they were pissed off and wanted to go down there and fight because they were not enslaved. There was a sizable free black community in the North and in New Orleans. None of that, and I suppose you could say those people escaped from slavery, at least there's a tangential claim there, yeah. but Irish immigration doesn't have anything to do with slavery. The claim itself is false, but it's made very consistently throughout the project. So each 1619 essay really consists on taking some aspect of American life, like why do the Yanks eat so much sugar, and trying to tie that to historical slavery. One of them, for example, uh, focused on traffic patterns, gridlock and congestion. And the idea was, I, I haven't read this in a couple of years, but as I recall, that historical race war, basically, segregation and conflict between groups, resulted in irrational designs for American cities, and that's why they're, they're hard to drive in. And most of this is, every time I've looked at one of these articles with a quant in that field, they're tenditious or false. I mean, for example, the, the West is legendary, where there were no slaves, is legendary for gridlock smog producing traffic i mean you you'd have to break down the the level of congestion in every city in the country and then you'd have to run a regression model linear or log land or something where you adjust for level of past racism and I, I don't think you'd find any any correlations at all but i mean that, that was the idea of the project that this is blacks or black historical slavery black migration made this country we're a slaveocracy and uh, a final kind of party, Parthian shot there. It, the basic label 1619 Project doesn't make any sense if you're talking about slavery. 
In 1619, slavery didn't yet exist. I mean, in my book, I note that the first slave owners, the first plate of them, come about in the 1650s. The first slave owner in America, Anthony Johnson, was probably a black man, by the way, a sort of black squire. We forget that free blacks could own both black slaves and white bond servants. But what slavery came out of was the charming pre-existing European practice of serfdom and bond servitude. So when blacks began to come to the United States, they were war captives and so on, of course. They didn't have any rights, of course. But the idea was that just like Irishmen, Scotsmen, so on, in that same unfortunate situation, if they worked for 10 years as, you know, blacksmiths, apprentices or whatever, of course, you're not actually learning a trade, you're just a slave, but that was the label. Yeah. You would then be set free and you'd get some acres of land and, and so on down the line. And that was followed reasonably, honorably for decades. Eventually, uh, masters, for want of a better word, began to sue and say that they should be able to hold their servants indefinitely. And the courts wrestled with this and they eventually kind of split the baby. They said you can keep a black servant, but not a white servant. Um, and that from that, you really got the genesis of historical American slavery, as, as I understand it. So, I mean, using the year 1619, that's just the year that captured black warriors came to the United States. That doesn't have much to do with the onset of, of chattel slavery as a practice. And by the way, like extending that to 2019 and saying we've had 400 years of slavery, which is what they tried to do with the project. No, we didn't, because slavery ended with the Civil War in 1865. <laughs> so there's yeah. just very basic issues for anyone that's familiar with American history. And I, I don't want to present myself as the greatest social scientist of my era. I'm, by no means, that's Tom Sowell and, or Roland Fryer and many other contenders in, in that, that first pack of that race. But I think whenever you've had someone serious, like the, the quantitative historian Bill Magnus, look at a lot of this stuff, these basic problems have come up where people have pointed out, you know, we were all oppressed colonials of the British Empire until 1776, and we ended slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 or 64. So you're actually talking about 88 years, right, not 400. And what you generally get there is just sort of a, a bunch of screaming, like, are you an Uncle Tom? Why do you hate yourself? And the first time I encountered this, I was genuinely baffled. As a person from the business world, like, well, I'm just using math. You know, math is a tool of the white man and the it just it, it, it's yeah. very, very difficult to take seriously. But so 1619 is one example. And you, you asked a good two part question. And because I'm a kind of rambly talker, I'm going to answer this in a sentence or two. And then we'll, I guess we'll move on. But the 1619 is an example of a broad trend that you're talking about, which is there's actually a term for this that James Lindsay uses. I believe the phrase is the skeptical lens. But many critical social scientists believe that you're supposed to look at our society through the most negative possible set of blind because they believe they've been so infected with racism and sexism and so on that they are they are de facto looking at our society through the most positive possible lens. Now, this is nonsensical. Again, there are tests in psychology to measure your attitudes towards your society. And most of these people, most American and Western leftists and liberals, already have very negative attitudes toward our society. But the combination of taking a person from the left parties who hates the country and then putting on the skeptical lens where you look at the country as badly as possible results in this extremely negative all warts portrayal of us and a refusal to portray our rivals in the same fashion. Yeah. And it is an Israeli. I'm sure you see this all the time where I'm sure Israel has made mistakes in war in the past, and so on. I strongly support Israel in the current conflict, by the way, as you know. But the opponent is Hamas at present. That's literally a terrorist group. Yeah. It's recognized as a terrorist group by every major nation in the world, including players like Germany and Saudi Arabia. So when people say things like Israel is unprovokedly butchering this innocent competitor, no, a, a nation that's literally led by terrorists started a war with the clearest causes belly I've ever seen. They killed 1,200 people, and the other side's now fighting a war. But yeah. if your focus is they must be good because we are bad, I have my, blind my blinders on, you come to these conclusions. What is the opponent of an evil person? Well, they're a good person. And we see this in social science as well as in foreign policy. Right, but let me just, I'll just say that even with, even let's say, let's just say that Israel is, the bad part here, which obviously, as someone who's 
an Israeli and went through October 7 and had not, a few of my friends die in the war. Yeah. And before I lost my sight, I was in reserve. So five, six years ago, I would be there now. But let's just put all that aside and just say, let's say Israel is the bad party. At, you have progressive people that come, you could come to Tel Aviv and go to the gay pride parade. You cannot yeah. go to Gaza City and go to the gay pride parade because the gays are not there. They've been killed. And so right. my point is that it doesn't even matter a lot of times. Let's say there's a conflict that America did in Iraq and you didn't support the war in Iraq. You wouldn't go and support the Iraqi way of life. You wouldn't go yeah. and support the Iraqi political uh, Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath party because you understand that even though we may make mistakes, we may be in the wrong in this specific conflict, you know which society holds your beliefs. And I think a lot of American Jews, just to, because uh, we spoke with a lot of them on the program, were were uh, progressive Jews were very surprised because their natural allies turned their backs on them right away. A on October 8th, there was protests in Times Square saying, very happy about what happened. Judith Butler, you mentioned academics. She's like the the great, this, you know, saint of modern feminism said that Hezbollah and Hamas are natural allies of the feminist movement. And so it's very, very, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe I'll ask you, where does this come from? Where do you think this natural hatred of us and this love of them comes from? Well, I think it, well, first of all, I think there are two things here. I think there's a lot of subsurface anti-Semitism. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, if you've ever spent time in the business world and so on, you, you see that it's it. I would say that I've seen more anti-Semitism and sexism than I've seen racism. None of them are at crippling levels. But I mean, the, there might be a joke about Jewish, quote unquote, stinginess or something that guys would have to react to in a fairly mainstream setting. You're not going to see a similar joke about black people being lazy or something like that. I personally have been pretty intolerant of all this kind of thing when I've been in a management role, at least. But it, you, you see that. And I think it, it's silly to deny that played some role. Like the, the frenzied hostility toward Israel, obviously, to some extent, has to do with the fact that a lot of people don't like Jews. Um, you know, if there was a crusader state, it, literally, yeah. if Outremer had survived in the Middle East and it was run by traditional French Catholics who got along well with their Arabic neighbors and so on. I mean, I'm sure the Muslims would love to conquer it, but you wouldn't see the same sort of hysteria, massive jihads funded around the world and so on. I mean, I, I think that's pretty given. But there, there's a broader reality here, because obviously Jews are uh, attacked often, but there, there's also a reality that Jews are attacked from the left by people that aren't anti-Semites. And I think that's, that's now probably the most common form of what outwardly appears to be anti-Semitism. Yes. And it's worth understanding why this is. And it's worth understanding why these attacks on Jews overlap with attacks on Anglo-whites with attacks on Asians, especially the overseas Chinese, attacks on black conservative business people, groups that other than maybe golfing together at a country club don't seem to have anything in common at all, right? Gender critical women who are generally aggressive feminists. Why are we all being attacked at once? And I think the answer is that there's a trend line in the kind of fourth wave feminism Butler's involved in or the kind of critical race theory that we see a lot of in the USA that kind of hates success. And it's not just irrational. It's not just vulgar Marxism. The basic theoretical idea is that the only reason people could be oppressed or the only reason people could be failing is that they are oppressed by bad people. I really think a lot of people believe this. So in the modern left, when you see opposition to genetic hereditarianism at any level, like there are genetic differences between men and women, IQ is real, whether or not it varies slightly among races. When you see these hysterical reactions, to these old dons like Charles Murray giving a Sherry speech, that's that's blank slateism, that all groups and probably all people are identically equal. That's a very poor idea. The feminists really believe this. Like I've gone on dates with feminist women who told me, you know, I think that if it weren't for social conditioning, men and women would be, you know, exactly equal in terms of sexual taste and case. I and, hope you, know, you ran away good. from the date. You did not stay for a second date. <laughs> well, I, I actually am still friends with some of these people. I find feminists enjoyable to spar with. But I mean, and, and by the way, like the idea, you know, men and women would be exactly equal in terms of, you know, sexual kink if it weren't for social conditioning is not entirely unpromising on a date as a college man. 
But then you'd go from there to, and we would also be physically equal in strength. Yes. Um, and these other things. And I, I am pretty open, or, you know, open mouth. So I, w- I would say, no, that's not true. I mean, when I was in high school, I was just an average athlete. I was on the varsity, but I was nothing special. But it was expected that varsity men would be able, whatever your sport, to run a mile between five and six minutes, you know, jump up and, and grab the rim on a basketball hoop, this sort of thing. The basketball players could, of course, all dunk backward. What percentage of women could do these things? Two or three. That, mm-hmm. That's not just due to training. We had elite female sports teams just outside of Chicago. So, but anyway, the idea is that the blank slate is real. So when you see massive gaps in performance between people, uh, blacks and whites, men and women, Arabs and Jews, there are two options. One is that the blank slate is not real, that there are, in fact, very large differences in at least culture and potentially in genes and human structuring between groups. Now, of course, this is true, at least at the cultural level. I mean, like, there clearly is a different attitude toward the police in the black community than in the middle class white community. We have all of this data, but you're, you're not supposed to say this, right? So the, the second and more palatable explanation is that someone is causing this failure. So what a critical theorist will do when they see a gap in performance between people is assume that the group that is performing better is the bad guy. And the group that is performing worse is the good guy. And the reason the group that is performing worse is performing worse is that they were hurt by the group that's doing better. And I I don't know how well I'm explaining this, but it's a very coherent theory. So this allows these people to squeeze the fight between the Israelis and the Arabs, for example, into this sort of paradigm that comes out of U.S. Jim Crow. Palestinians, on average, this is not genetic, by the way. Palestinians are just West Asian and Caucasians. But tested IQ, I think, is 78. Average income is $1,200 a year, something like that. Mm -hmm. And... There are reasons for that, like the country's run by a terrorist group that steals all the foreign aid. But an obvious explanation is the Jews are making them behave in this way. So the the evil in this region is not the group that is failing and doing evil. It is the group that is making them do that. I think that's the overarching, very politically incorrectly put, but that's the overarching explanation someone would give there. I don't think it's so politically incorrect. It's basically said totally in the open. The fact that the, the, they, they keep on showing the Palestinians, uh, they have the, the, everything is destroyed and Israel is so built and technological and all that. And that is going to show that if they have it so bad and we have it so good, it must be that they have it so bad because we have it so good. That is the basic. The only reason why someone would be bad is because someone else is good and there's, it's a zero sum game. And. Also, weirdly, that they keep on calling Israelis a white society when, when just in terms of ethnically, most Israelis aren't white. Like, I'm Ashkenazic, but my wife's Iraqi yeah. and, uh, and Persian. Her father's are from Baghdad, her mother's from Isfahan. So, and most Israelis are not white anymore ethnically. But I think the reason why they keep on calling, Isra- their tr- why they keep on calling Israelis white is that that basically goes in with the talking points of American politics. So an American progressive needs to see his worldview totally, everything needs to be the same. And so if he sees that blacks are oppressed and the whites are the oppressor, then he needs to translate that to Israelis, and it doesn't matter the truth. Yeah, one thing that's interesting about race is how invented a lot of the categories are. So I mean, like, obviously, there are broad groups like European and West Asian, Caucasian that include everything from Hispanos to Jews to Irishmen and so on. But I mean, like, for example, I am, if I had to think about it scientifically, I'm probably a bit under 45 percent Bantu black, a bit under 45 percent Celtic white. And the rest would be sort of Native American, which is an Asian descent population when you think about it. And what I've found is that when I encounter people from most of the world, like Latin America, Italy, the Middle East, I look pretty much like a lot of them, which <laughs> kind of tells you something about mankind's, you know, war and trade and so on over the years. Like those three great races probably, you know, fought and encountered one another pretty frequently. I don't I don't think it's a mystery that much of the world has sort of this coloration and facial yeah. feature and so on. The Moors and all that. Moors are just a mix of black and white to some extent. But at any rate, um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to describe the people literally from the Isaac and Ishmael story as different races or anything like that. 
what you're cool. what you're doing is you're taking this situation and you're putting it into the pre-existing religious framework. So the pre-existing religious framework is everyone is exactly equal. That's true at the group level. It's generally true at the individual level. So when we see massive performance differences, what we're seeing is oppression. And the people who are succeeding are the oppressors. Now, in reality, we have massive evidence that this isn't true. So in the United States, we actually keep track of income by ethnic group on an annual basis. And you can find this on Wikipedia, Britannica, just the online encyclopedias. It comes from the American Community Survey. It's not seriously contested. And every year, I mean, the, the highest income group in the United States is Indian Americans at $140,000 a year. If you break out Jewish Americans, they're usually number two or three, 125,000 or something. I don't think that surprises anyone. Chinese Americans, about the same. Taiwanese Americans. So the best educated group is Nigerians, who are a black group. Uh, they, they make about 80,000, 85,000 a year, I think. They, they were doing a little poorly in the years that are on record, but have improved since. Um, so there's really no evidence at all when we try to empirically look that how you do in life depends on sort of your pre-existing power position or what other people do to you. But the fact that the theory is wrong doesn't make it, it doesn't render it non-pervasive. It's what we see constantly in social science. And so last comment, but I've spent a fair amount of time the past couple of weeks prepping a new article and sort of arguing with feminists online and in academic locations, which isn't really all that rewarding, but I mean, I keep finding it, <laughs> you know, hard to not point out. And I think one of the issues a lot of people have with modern feminism is not the idea that women should have full rights or should be able to be executives or shouldn't be raped or abused. Right. I mean, everyone agrees with that. It's the idea that every gap between men and women represents oppression, just like gaps between blacks and whites do. And in the sexual context, that's insane. Like the idea that women are better at childcare and should do more of it reflects very basic biological realities. I mean, women like children 10 or 12 times as much as non-pedophilic men do. Women have an emotional intelligence that's two or three times the male level, whereas men are better direct battle leaders and so on. Like, no one even disputes this. But if you have to ignore all of it, you, you come to, to conclusions like this. Well, any gap is due to oppression. And these yeah. male-female gaps are huge. Like, all of the nurses are women. All the equally paid cops are men. This must be one of the most oppressive societies in history. And, and ideas like this are very prevalent. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, was, that I find interesting to want, want to ask your opinion about is the fact that a lot of what we're seeing since October 7th, but even before, I don't know if you remember, in the early 2000s, we had the Mohammed Adora case where there was a Palestinian child that the French TV cameras showed that he was shot. And then it probably turned out that he wasn't shot, but the pictures went all over the world and showed how mean the Israelis are during the second intifada. And so, and all over the time, there's been these hoaxes where the Palestinians, there's even a, a, a term, a Pallywood, where they yeah. would show that these kids are dead and then the camera pans out and you're able to see in the edge of the lens that the kid, the dead kid gets up and walks away with all the blood that's ketchup and he's eating it. And so you have all these things. And, and a lot, like if you remember the beginning of the war where there was this hospital and the missile fell supposedly that the Israel shot and they said there was like 600 people died. Within a half hour, they knew exactly 600. And then it turned out that it was a missile that they shot and there was only like 20 people that died and it was in a parking lot and all these kinds of stuff. So one of the things that I remember was that you wrote a book about hoaxes yep. and about that. Ra I think ra mostly I think racial hoaxes in America. And I was thinking of asking you whether there is a first of all, whether you uh, if you could tell us about it. But secondly, if you think this sort of thing makes sense in the general narrative that you were talking about, meaning. That if the whole point of a racial hoax, and tell me if I'm correct, oh, yeah. is to show and prove how racist society is, how bad America is, how black people have it so bad because the white people in America are destroying them and doing all these racial stuff to them. The same is true for Israelis. When we show a Palestinian being killed, even though he isn't killed, we're inclined to believe it if we're coming at it and trying to show the whole world. Here, look, my social media, look at this poor Palestinian kid that the mean white Israelis killed. And so maybe you can talk to us about that. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, I mean, first of all, the Israel-Palestine war is one of the things that really showed me the power of media control of information. And I, I don't know, I actually don't know if I'm an, enough of an expert to really talk about this at length, but I mean, most people don't know that news outlets get their video from stringers on the ground. And a lot of the stringers on the ground in Gaza are, to put it mildly, sympathetic to Hamas. <laughs> They're so, terrorists I mean, themselves a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, well, this is like the, what is it, UNRWA, the UN agency in the area. Yeah. Members have been found to be Hamas terrorists and frontline fighters before. And this is the agency that runs the schools in the region. And mm -hmm. it, it's funny to banter about, but there's also a, a serious problem there in that you're radicalizing generation after generation of people there. What What's happening with the Palestinians is that they're being used in what um, a student of like Native American history might call a dog soldier role. The powerful, highly civilized Arab states like having a proxy that they can use to fight the Israelis, and they have no interest in admitting the Palestinians. I mean, there have been, as you know better than me, I mean, multiple... Yeah peace talk processes where Egypt, Jordan, the, these significant countries have been asked, would you, would you take control of this land? Hell no. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it absolutely not is the decision. Uh, it's even worse than that, Wilfred. I'll just point out that yep. until 1967, Gaza was controlled by Egypt and the West Bank was controlled by Jordan. They never, during those from 48 to 67, never tried to make the Palestinian citizens, never wanted to give them a state, etc. You know, so, I mean, we have a time, significant amount of time where they actually controlled it, but refused to give them rights that they're now asking Israel to give them. So, yes, I mean, and there, there's there's a lot that's gone on with this. I mean, so when people say refugee camp, for example, in the context of the yeah. war, like Israel launched a bomb into a refugee camp, I think most people picture like crying women sitting outside tents, you know, beating cornmeal into groats and <laughs> yeah. buckets. The, the refugee camps are cities. I mean, yes. I found this out years ago for a project when I Googled some of them, and it, you mean, you find them again on the online EPDA, the CIA World Factbook, population uh, 212,000 and so on down the line. What that means is that the, the Palestinian question hasn't been resolved, largely due to the intransigence of Palestinian leadership, for what 70 years i mean there's well, nothing's been decided and so these people have been living in these two regions and have just established stable brick-built communities where they are mm -hmm. and i mean when you talk about like the right of return for palestinian refugees my understanding is that the un term palestinian refugee means anyone who is or is descended yes. from a Palestinian person who moved at all during the war, 48 war, I believe, yes. that led to the migration of, of that population group. Yes. So if you look at Gaza's population of about 3 million, they undercount, and then the West Bank's population of 5 to 7 million, there would be 10 million Palestinian refugees that are claiming the right to return to Israel, which is a country not significantly larger, which would obviously destroy the state of Israel. I think that what happened in the Middle Eastern conflict is one of the things that made me skeptical of the media. Like we talked about who some of the stringers actually worked for. I mean, one of the things that I would notice as someone who was very online when computers sort of first took off and who was also watching TV is that you'd see situations where, for example, Israeli soldiers are shooting and then yeah. Palestinian soldiers, warriors, terrorists, whatever term you want to use, are shooting. And a kid is shot. And the kid's probably shot by the Palestinians. But you don't know. It's hard to tell in these kind of gunfights. But the clip you see on television is not the internet 10-minute clip. It shows Israeli soldiers shooting. And then you see a kid get shot, and you never see the Palestinians shooting. The uh, sci-fi writer Dave, David Drake does a great two-page description of this in one of his books. But the assumption everyone has around the world after that, you know, Qatar money gets involved, is that the Israelis shot the kid. Because yes. you don't see the other side shooting back with equal eff eff efficacy. Do I think that there's a comparison between U.S. race dynamics and that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I definitely do. Um, and I, I think this is across the table, actually. So, I mean, when you talk about the whole George Floyd hysteria, one of the things that drove that was the constant presentation in U.S. mass media of these videos of black men, for many of whom looked like normal citizens, whether or not they were, first getting into confrontations with the police and then being killed. 
Yeah. And the expectation was, well, this must happen every day. At once a week, I see one of these videos. But if you actually went to killed by police, like the Washington Post excellent database, what you found out rapidly was that the media was running with every single video of this happening, one. And two, they were ignoring videos of whites and Hispanics getting killed. They were up to 10 times as common. So there maybe a fourth, maybe an eighth of the police shooting victims in a given month would be black, but only the blacks would be forwarded and this would be presented as though it was an epidemic. Like George Floyd, I mean, a tragic killing, but, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of focus on the drug element of that at first. And there were, the video was shown dozens of times every day and it creates a panic. So in terms of hoaxes, I think I wrote a book called Hate Crime Hoax, yeah. as you pointed out. And the point of hate crime hoax was that a very large number of, and it's important to put this properly because, of course, most rape allegations or something aren't, aren't fake. Most, uh, most people claiming they were beaten up by two males of the other race outside a country bar, that's a, that's a real misdemeanor crime. But of these high-profile race allegations that we saw over the past 10 years, and not just on the left, a very large number and percentage turned out to be fake. I think you can say that fairly. Like Jussie Smollett, uh, yeah. Yasmin Saweed with the torn hijab. This specifically was a Muslim on white, and I think to some extent Muslim on Jewish case. Uh, Covington Catholic, not necessarily. But I mean, it would, have, it would have been a crime, right? The claim was that a, a group of kids surrounded a Native American Indian elder, and they were mocking him and shoving him a bit, and they were trying to take his sacred drum. None of it happened. You know, Duke Lacrosse going back a little bit. That was supposed to be a hate rape by multiple males who were semi-pro-athletes, um, you know, Tawana Brawley back in the day, Goucher College, Air Force Academy. So I asked the question of why this kept happening. And in the book, the book's based around a data set that I put together, which right now, we don't need to debate every incident, but it's about 500 cases. And as you can probably tell from some of these caveats, like there's been some debate about this with other professionals and reporters and so on. It's a fascinating book to talk about. But I was able to put together a data set of, you know, 500 case studies, more than a thousand incidents. Now, to put this in context, there were only about six or seven thousand hate crimes reported in a typical year. And as far as I can tell, only about a tenth of those received the kind of media attention that I would need to put the incident in the book. So this is a pretty substantial block of all of the hate crimes if you have a thousand of these. But mm -hmm. at any rate, I put together this data set and I found that, especially on college campuses, people were, were faking these all the time. And so the question becomes, why? And I think that you hit on it really with the first try, which is, if your argument is that racism causes every single gap between black people and white people, you know, Hispanics and, you know, long settled Yanks, men and women, so on, well, where is that racism? Or I guess in the last case, that sexism, where is it? Because in normal upper middle class life, you just don't see it. Yes. And so I think a lot of people who don't see much, if any, racial prejudice around them in a setting like Bowdoin University or something like that, Bowdoin College, kind of decide to invent it. And that, that's very specifically what we saw. I mean, one of the cases in the book, less sentence, but one of the cases in the book involves the president of the campus, I think it was the Gay Straight Alliance and the Office of Bias Incidents. So this student leader was going around the campus spray painting things like tranny go home on buildings so that there would then be something for her to discuss. Because if there's, I mean, why have this GSA, all these people sitting around discussing their sexuality? Certainly, why have this office of hate crimes if you're just this well-adjusted college campus where everyone's yeah. focused on you know, getting laid and playing Frisbee? So the, the crime was created to justify the existence of the pursuers. Uh, one, one thing that I remember there was a case where, um, tell me if you spoke about this, where this NASCAR driver, a black NASCAR driver, said that he saw oh, yeah. a noose. I forgot the guy's name, but he was a black NASCAR driver. He saw a noose. And then I don't think, I don't remember if he himself said that this was for sure a racist thing, but the media, I remember, went with it. And everybody was saying how this is like a, a racist proof that everything's racist. And these white NASCAR fans are all racist. And then it turned out, and they actually, I think, walked with him, all the NASCAR drivers in solidarity. And then it turned out that it was a thing that they put in to pull down the garage and, or something to that extent. And I remember thinking at the yeah. time, how, how convenient when everybody, and it's like, it's so, 
It's so easy to go down. Why would anyone look for any other reason when that's what you want to find? And I remember also just one last point on that is I wrote an article during the George Floyd, I'm the op-ed editor at the paper, and I wrote, a, there was, the paper had this big thing about what's happening in the U.S. It was obviously all over. And so everybody we had, no one was willing pretty much to write, you know, maybe it's not that, not that bad for black people in America. Maybe right. there's something else happening. Maybe we need to look at the statistics, like you said. And not right. just that the hysteria. I wrote an article and I, I, I put some of the stuff, the statistics that you said, and I got WhatsApp messages and emails of people saying that they were very angry at me for minimizing the, the issue. And I said, I'm not, you know, I just gave the statistics. Like you said, it's not minimizing it when you're saying the truth. And, and I think that also points to the fact that people want a certain narrative. So they'll, they're, they get angry when you actually point out the actual truth. So, so that's um, an interesting, uh, I, I think that's probably something that you also um, meet personally when you write these stuff. People are angry at you for pointing out the truth. Yeah, very often. I mean, so the, the case you're talking about, the NASCAR driver, that was yes. actually a guy named Bubba Wallace. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Bubba Wallace claimed that he went into his NASCAR garage and he found that there had been a noose tied and yeah. left in the garage. And the reaction was pretty much exactly what you described, like, I'm a black driver. I know what this was. You know what? I, I know what a noose is. It's very intentional when you tie a noose. And it, it turns out that most intelligent people should have known that this was not what it was claimed to be right off the bat. So like NASCAR drivers switch garages every week to prevent people from kind of setting up a machine shop in there so they can do things to their cars during pit stops and so on. So someone would have had to know that like six weeks out, a black guy was going to be using that garage and then tie this thing and put it on the door just to, to confront him, like a, a raccoon sitting in a corner or something. And that, that seems really unlikely. More to the point, because it turned out to be a door pull, the noose was like this big. It was as big as the palm <laughs> of your hand. So you clearly couldn't hang anyone with it. And that's why pictures of it in articles are always from these weird angles, like reporters would step back and take a picture so that you couldn't tell the size of the thing. Because it was laughable if you could just look at the noose and say, well, you know, Mr. Wallace is 6'5". What exactly was he afraid of here? But yeah, all the drivers at NASCAR did a ceremonial walk around the track, which is a big thing that might sometimes follow something like an Indy yeah. 500 victory. They're cheering crowd, as I remember it, so on down the line. Um, and it, it just turned out to be BS. Well, and, for that one, and, yeah. yeah, one last question yeah. that I know we, you know, we're, we're talking for so long, and I really hope that we'll do it. I, I have so much stuff to ask you, but I do sure. want one last thing to talk with you sure. about, which is that everything we've been talking about, I want to explain through you how it has real-life consequences. So one of the things that I saw that you spoke about not too long ago was the yeah. Black Lives Matter effect on actual crime. So could you maybe just explain to us just to finish off how everything we spoke about and then it comes to a head after the George Floyd killing with all the protests and the, you know, defund the police and all these. I remember when I was younger, the Ferguson effect, when Obama was president. So what exactly did you when you look at the statistic, when you look at what happened, what did it actually affect policing in these in black neighborhoods, for example? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So I, I think all of these things have real empirical effects in the world. There is a tendency to look at the nonsense in academia and say, well, OK, like I understand these are you know upper middle class citizens, but they're also weirdo eggheads with purple hair that are talking about queer gender theory. Who cares? You know, I'm an engineer. Yeah. The, the problem is that when leader, when Kshatriya is the term an Indian leader might use, call on the Brahmin, when they call on the people in sociology and psychology and so on to help them design city plans and the like, in the USA or the UK or Israel, for that matter, these are now the people that they're calling on. Now, there might be a disproportionate likelihood that they call on me or someone else who owns a suit and seems sane, but very often this sort of stuff is going to slither its way into the mainstream. And there's some examples I might give from, again, the, the feminist and men's rights world in a second that are they're just as crazy. But, um, in terms of the, the primary effect of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter kept arguing that day-to-day -day policing was a, for, a form of like invasive abuse of the black community. 
And there are a ton of books that, that make this argument, like Michelle Alexander is a new Jim Crow. The claim is that enforcing the law has replaced segregation as sort of a way of holding down black and Latino men, that there are all these people in jail for kind of small scale drug offenses, domestic violence offenses. This isn't true, by the way. Like the conviction rate in rape cases, the conviction rate in DV cases for both men and women is on the order of like 5%. The most common crime that both men and women, both black men and white men, are in jail for long term is murder. So, or prison. Sorry, it's certainly not true for women in jail. But for both yeah. black and white men in prison, the most common long term offense is murder. But so there's this argument that just enforcing the law is a form of oppression. It's a form of abuse. It's very common. You've heard it. So when Black Lives Matter started making this claim, one of the things that happened that was very measurable. And myself and a colleague, Bob Moranto of the University of Arkansas, have actually looked at this. Um, police started stopping people less. So you can actually track the rate at which major departments say they interact with people, they pull over a car, they pull over an individual, they stop someone, they, they don't frisk them totally, but they do what's called a pat down. And all of that declined dramatically after BLM in pretty much every major city. And what you saw is that along with that, crime skyrocketed. So there's, there's a piece, this began in just a USA Today column, it was, as I understand, later expanded into an article, but this is by a very serious guy, Jason Johnson, who used to be a police commissioner, where he notes the decline in police stops, and then he points out that murders in 2020, 2021, I think 2022, skyrocketed back over 20,000, which was what you were seeing during the bad old days in America in the 1990s. So mm -hmm. as you stopped interacting specifically with black people, you started seeing the homicide rate rise again to ski slope levels. And the worst thing about this is that it was really confined to black people. So you hardly saw the white or even Hispanic homicide rate budge. In fact, poor white and Spanish communities were often disgusted by BLM. So they would make shows of support for their cops. These were the tough guys you saw with Blue Lives Matter flags and so on. So there, you didn't see any increase in, in murders whatsoever. The black murder rate between 2012 and 2022 roughly doubled. So this figure is age-adjusted, but it went from 16.9 to 33.0 per 100,000. So the U.S. murder rate overall is high. It's usually 6 per 100,000. Blacks, for whatever reason, higher than that. Two to three times as high, 16, 15. But after the BLM catastrophe to me in policing, you saw the murder rate rise to Jamaican levels. I mean, 35 people per 100,000 people per year. Wow. So that was the actual effect. Like, one, you had this trackable thing, stops, that decreased, that sometimes fell by half. You saw a crime overall surge, murder overall for the whole country go over 20,000. And when you broke out black people, who remember less than 15% of the country, you saw that the murder rate had doubled. So that's a, that's a very real effect of this idea. And uh, kind of a final point on this, there was actually a guy, um, this became a Daily Mail article in a scholarly paper. I forget his, his institution. But there was a young scholar who looked specifically at what happened in cities that had Black Lives Matter marches. Like, did murder increase more there? And what he found was that just having had these damn protests, having had the cops one, have to spend a bunch of their time following these people around downtown to prevent violence and then, you know, taking meetings and being told to police less. Having had a protest in your town had a mild negative effect on police shootings of criminals, but it had a massive, it was like a 20 plus percent, there's a, there a correlation with something like a 20 plus percent increase in overall murders. So someone actually just looked empirically at this one variable, like did BLM, not just the general trend of the times, but did these marches correlate with a surge in homicides in the same city? And they found that the answer was yes. So, yeah. I mean, that, that's an absolutely astonishing finding. And it's, it's one of, of many that came out of that era. Can I do one last thing before you go? Uh, just as you're talking, I'm thinking about it, that we hear a lot about in Israel about the DEI thing that's the craze that's going through every single institution in the U.S., at least that's what it looks like from here. And my question is to you, is that what's happening? Is there, are there any institutions in America that you can hire people on merit anymore? Are there people like you, do they send you at your university to DEI courses to brainwash you? I mean, 
it's a weird question to ask, but I'm looking from afar and everything that I'm hearing and seeing is that people with views that are not what we're, we've been talking about this whole hour are being silenced, number one, but number two, also shoved into like re-education camps and corporations and higher institutions. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't even understand how this is even happening, but how do you just to finish off what, you know, the fact that you're even talking to me about these things, how do you do it? Well, I mean, I, I think part of it is just uh, a sense of independence. I mean, I have no doubt that I could get hired again back in the, the business world, the market sector or something like that. I mean, I absolutely don't want to. I like teaching. But, um, you know, I do pretty well as a consultant. I have several income streams. I mean, without false modesty, all my books were bestsellers, at least categorically on Amazon and so on. So, I mean, I, I think to some extent, I just talk about things I'm interested in. And one interesting side effect of teaching at a historically black college is they certainly wouldn't tolerate any actual racism, but they're not as woke as the stereotypical, like I said, blue haired college kids at Barnard or something. I mean, mm -hmm. almost our entire executive leadership team is black. The president's from West Africa. Um, and the people that aren't, I, th I think we have one Jewish guy, one Hispanic guy. I mean, they're, they're not exactly, you know, wasps either. I mean, it's, a, you can't really blame the white man for being behind on budget or something. So there's, a, there's a range of perspectives. I mean, probably 15, 20% of the people here would be black Republicans. So I, I think there's, there's less of a sense of panic about, you know, how dare he breach taboo. Uh, all of us would be in, you know, the a fairly high social class in a minority group. So there's, there's a little less of that, that frenzy. And I mean, I, I think that's pretty much it, actually. I'm, I'm fairly stable and I have the, the luxury of not really working. But at not abuse talking abuse. about you just as, just to, just to like finish the, the answer is that sure. if we put you yourself aside in your institution, do you see from other academics that they are worried about talking about certain subjects or oh, really? let's say, cause I remember reading, um, Roland Fryer, I think his name was from Harvard, and he said oh, yeah. that academics told him that when he came up with a certain, when the results of a certain, what he, his, uh, you know, what he wrote, what he checked on police um, violence. So he had the one thing about pushing people, the smaller violence was blacks suffered more, but the actual shootings and murders by police, the, the whites, I think, were more or basically the same. So there wasn't any discrepancy against blacks. And he said people came to him and said, don't publish the ones that aren't according to the narrative. Okay. And my question is, do you, do you see this in other institutions? So let's say you want to collaborate on a certain article or a certain piece and people will say, no, 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 that's too, I can't get close to that because, you know, people will say this and that and that about me. Um, very occasionally. I mean, there are, there are topics that are considered edgy. I, I do a fair amount of sort of normal academic work. I mean, I was asked to write a review of a piece on American, uh, kind of racial history for a middle West review this year. I did, uh, Bob Maranto and I published in one of the better, um, and of course, Pat Wolf from U Arkansas, one of the better kind of public administration focused journals this year. I'm one of the a series of authors on a piece in uh, PNAS, which is frankly one of the better journals in the country. I'm not the lead on that by any means. Um, and I mean, sometimes I'm told, yeah, I think you're a bit of an edgy guy. Like I'm, well, myself and a colleague, Dr. Amadifa, are working on a piece on charter cities right now. Charter cities, as you know, are these areas in uh, third world countries where an external corporation or something will come in and say, well, we're willing to invest a certain amount of money and develop a series of subdivisions and properties. We're not going to do that under, you know, Congolese law. So you have to give us these these protections. And this is considered a, a kind of an edgy thing because it, it smacks of colonialism. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I, I asked my co-author, you know, are you comfortable writing with me on this? And he, he is a gentleman. He said, yeah, but we, we talked about it for a little bit. You know, um, and I've, I've talked to other people like Bruce Gilley, who actually wrote the case for colonialism. And he's described the reaction he's gotten to that death threats and all kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, in general, I think short of myself or Bruce Gilley, most academics do have so, so there there are two levels of censorship. It's and I, I think most humans censor themselves to some degree, even in situations where you kind of know what's going on. Like on a there's a famous joke from a female comedian, like you know on a third date in the USA or France, you know what's up, but you're not going to be like, 
like, wait, fucking? Excuse the language. Yeah. Like, you're not gonna, it just express every one of your opinions. So on, on the one hand, I think there's that. That's level one. On the second, I think that in many areas like academia in the USA, there's, a, there's an extreme, extremely restricted range of Overton opinions. So, I mean, about 93% of academic professors are leftist liberals or left-leaning moderates. It's also true for journalists. That's a famous Q2004, but almost the exact same categories apply in academia. So uh, a lot of things just aren't considered. And I think when something is considered, when people talk about Tom Sowell's ideas over like, you know, a, you know, whiskey enlightened dinner, you know, people say, well, that's fascinating. It may, but I'm not going to publish that yeah. paper. So those, those three all come into play. And just as a, a quick comment on that, I think you see this not in terms of what gets published being worthless, but in terms of all the things that aren't public. So like an example would be, there's a whole genre of studies that are called list experiments, where people will send a series of resumes into a business, and some will have stereotypical black names, and some will have yeah. stereotypical white names. The white names will generally be treated about 7% better. Okay, we've still found pretty substantial racism. But there are so many obvious caveats, like stereotypically black names tend to be working class. So what would happen if you took stereotypically lower class white names like Bubba or Jordy or something like Robert E. Lee, and you <laughs> did a hundred of those and then a hundred black guys and names like Jamaria. And my assumption has always been the black guys would be more likely to get hired. No one, no one's ever tested it. What happens if to counter the perceived effects of affirmative action, you were simply to put an undeniable IQ score somewhere in the papers, like a GRE, you know, 14, 20 uh, on the old scale. I'm very proud of this. Just wanted to note it. My assumption would be that the hiring gap would pretty much vanish. No one's ever done that. So you see that the, the limitation on the Overton range prevents Once. people from doing a lot of things. More so than like the list experiment is worthless. Like, no, it's fine. But, you know, have you ever done one with, with these different parameters? And the answer is no. Yeah. Well, Wilfred Riley, it was uh, a pleasure talking to you uh, with all the technical difficulties and the scheduling difficulties. Okay. But I do appreciate it. And it was fascinating. And I do hope that in the near future or even in the future future, we'll have you again. And obviously, you're welcome to Israel when... Hopefully, when everything calms down. So, I'd love to have you for Shabbat dinner. Uh, so, that's an official invitation on our podcast. And it uh, was a pleasure talking to you. Sounds good. And I will definitely call you if and when I am ever in uh, Israel.